Hello, welcome to the Monday, June 10th, 2019 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Neptune, New Jersey. We've got some feedback regarding the Gold Brute bot scanning for open RDP servers that we wrote about last week. One user via Twitter reported what looks like a slightly modified payload that included a sort of a jihadist spam, also a lot of other random text. We downloaded a payload that uh, our variant offered actually several times from different systems, different IP addresses, and never really got anything different. So never really uh, saw any purpose in this bot beyond just scanning and uh, enumerating essentially vulnerable RDP servers. So for everybody who reported this other variant, uh, seems to refer to the same GitHub repository. So it seems to be a single source at this point that offers uh, this uh, variant with more of a payload. In Weekend Diaries, we got two logging-related diaries. First one by Xavier about WMI logs. WMI, short for Windows Management Instrumentation, is a remote management technology built into Windows. And well, of course, uh, Malware likes that as well. So logging WMI activity is certainly important. Now, Xavier shows uh, how to enable event tracing for WMI to get more more meaningful logs. Otherwise, you really only get sort of failed access to WMI. Xavier also points out that if you do actually enable event tracing, since it's a debugging feature, it's intended to only run for a short time and Windows will by default only collect eight kilobytes worth of WMI tracing logs. The second logging related diary comes from Didier. He points out that Sysmon will add DNS logging to an upcoming release of Sys internals. Now, I've mentioned logging DNS traffic multiple times here in the podcast. It is sort of one of my favorite topics. What Sysmon adds here is that when it does its DNS logging, it will actually add information about the process that sent the DNS query. Of course, if you are logging either on the network using tools like Seek, or if you're logging on your recursive DNS server, then you get the DNS queries, but you sort of lost that information what process did request that particular DNS entry, which uh, I can see as very valuable, in particular if you're investigating malware. And blockchain company Komodo took the somewhat controversial action to hack its customers' wallets to protect them from attackers. Komodo's Agama wallet is built using, well, NPM, the node package manager. And it turns out that one particular module that's used by Agama wallet was found to include a keystroke logger. The keystroke logger sent passphrases that were used to initialize wallets to a public website. And of course, these passphrases can then be used to reconstruct the secret keys. And according to Komodo, it appeared that the attacker has already started to exploit affected wallets. So what Komodo did was, since the website where all of these secrets were being transmitted to was public, Komodo just downloaded that information, used it to recreate its user's secret keys, which Komodo didn't know otherwise, and then used these secret keys to actually transfer all all funds from affected wallets into its own wallet or account. Now, of course, Komodo did offer to return the money to all of the affected wallets, but of course, now they first have to go through sort of a process to authenticate the users of these wallets, which, if I understand it right, is using those same compromised keys. Aside from the crypto coin effect here, uh, one of the real problems is these compromised uh, NPM 
libraries. In this particular case, the attacker apparently waited until a few important projects used the particular library and then added the malicious code. Now, we have seen it in the past also where malicious actors sort of take over uh, popular libraries and then change them. Of course, it's hard to tell whether it was the original author of the library or not that actually made this change. Now, theoretically, of course, you could review the source code for all of these libraries, but with projects uh, including dozens of uh, different libraries, that turns out to be not really practical. And creating and running a security operation center or SOC is uh, well a difficult task and usually also a very expensive undertaking. So. Uh, you probably want to get it right. Now, that's important and it's nice to learn, of course, uh, what others uh, learned as they set up uh, their socks. Microsoft's security team now created a set of blog posts sharing some of the lessons learned from the Microsoft SOC. One of the hard issues is that they're attacking sort of in their latest installment of this series is how do you actually hire the right people and how do you retain them? Now that's a subject that often comes up you know, when I'm teaching the intrusion detection in depth class because it's often taught to analysts that are working in a SOC and just to share some of the lessons that I learned here is first of all, you know, offer a clear career path and that's something uh, that uh, actually the Microsoft blog here speaks to as well. And secondly, when you hire, uh, don't really focus too much on people that understand or have used specific tools because the tools will change. So uh, that knowledge really becomes stale very quickly. Instead, uh, try to hire people with the right aptitude and uh, in particular people who sort of enjoy learning and enjoy staying up to date and and really enjoy sort of the puzzle game that quite often is involved in sock work. Also, another important part in retaining talent that I found is it's really important to sort of convey the value that these SOC analysts provide. Quite often, sort of, you know, it feels like whack them all. You, you basically uh, take out the same uh, ransomware, or whatever the threat of the day is over and over. It's good to sometimes show uh, the SOC team how things changed over time and uh, maybe how based on their works of some policies changed that actually made a difference for the organization. Well, uh, that's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.